very glad to see everyone here in this um, sunny half winter, half spring day. Um, and I'm especially glad uh, to welcome here our distinguished speakers, whom I'd like to introduce. You are <clears throat> an IASC workshop, roundtable discussion. Um, I ask, as most of you know, is a relatively new, young institute, which was established only a year and a half ago with some special purposes. One of those purposes are, or is, to <coughs> pursue, organize um, discussions like this. Um, thanks to organizational havocs, we didn't have too many chances uh, to do so. So this is one of our, our first occasions um, to bring here um, influential, important um, people who are both um, active, used to be and hopefully will be active in, in social sciences, in the academia and also in public life, um, in politics. Uh, <clears throat> the, in the institute doesn't want to become an ivory tower for academic research, but of course we are pursuing research on a high level, I hope. Um, and we also do not want to become just a think tank, um, putting together policy recommendations. We would like to combine these two activities. So this is one of our attempts today. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also very glad to see here ambassadors, Madame ambassadors from Slovenia and from Austria. Thank you for coming. And one of our other purposes um, to have to organize, to um, bring together people from Central Europe to organize debates on and about Central Europe, its past, but mostly about its present and the future. So I'm very happy again to introduce you these three speakers. Um, <clears throat> um, Dr. Erhard Buzek, and let me read because they have very, very substantial and exciting CVs. Um, <clears throat> he received his Doctor of Law degree in 63 at the University of Vienna and um, he began his professional career as a legal advisor of the parliamentarians of the Christian Conservative Austrian People's Party, UVP, where he pursued his political career later. From 89, he was appointed as Minister of Science and Research, and in 91, Dr. Buzek became chairman of the Austrian People's Party, and he served as vice chancellor of Austria in the decisive period of Austria as joining the EU. Um, but he was also a special representative of Austrian government on EU enlargement, which position he held until the end of 2001, and a special coordinator of the Stability Pact of Southeastern Europe, one of our major topics today. And currently he is chairman of the Institute of Danube Region and Central Europe. And last but not at least, he is a Jean Monnet professor and at personam, and we have several Jean Monnet professors in this room today. That means that um, whatever you hear from us um, criticizing what is going on in, in EU, we are criticizing from within. Yeah? From, that we are ardent Europeanists. And he's a member of the European Council on Tolerance and Reconciliation. Now, <clears throat> um, Professor Danilo Turk, uh, he is a professor of international law. I don't know if you are still teaching? No, emeritus. Emeritus. Well, so I do a little bit. Well, he's going to teach here in Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. clears throat> uh, and a, a long time United Nations diplomat and the former president of the Republic of Slovenia between 2007 and 2012. From 84 to 92, he was a member of the United Nations subcommissions on prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities, and uh, the first Slovene ambassador to UN between 92 and 2000. Between 2000 and 2005, um, Dr. Turk was UN Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and also the President of the UN Secretary Council in 1989 and 1999. He's also a former member of the Human, uh, Human Rights Committee of the UN and in, 19, in 2016, 
the UN Secretary General election, uh, Danilo Turk was um, nominated as a candidate. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have to mention too that Dr. Turk is recently um, a research fellow at IASC. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and so is Dr. Professor Ahmed Ebin, with whom we have been together, um, working together for a long time, I think <coughs> since the end of the 90s. Um, Professor Ebin was the founding dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanchi University, and um, uh, he received his PhD from Columbia University in Middle East Studies and Cultural History. He is the um, Director of Education of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture and coordinated the Aga Khan program at Harvard University and MIT. Um, uh, Dr. Evin initiated a policy dialogue on EU's eastward expansion, its Mediterranean policy. And um, he was one of the founders of the European University Institute's Schumann Center, um, together with the Schumann Center of the EU Turkish Observatory, of which I was a member as well. And at that time, we had very serious hopes about, um, about a stronger cooperation between um, the European Union and Turkey. My first question, if you take my um, advice, to talk a little bit about, about the dangers um, and the peculiarities of our present um, geopolitical situation before we start to talk about um, Central European and um, East uh, Central European, South uh, East European issues. Um, I don't know who would start. President. Yes, first. President. Mr. Okay. President. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Misovitz, and thank you for the opportunity which you gave us all. Uh, I'm very excited today because I have accepted some time ago to become a fellow at, uh, at this uh, very promising um, academic uh, project. And obviously, I prepared myself for today uh, also with the aim to develop my ideas further when we meet again. Yes. So, as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say, I shall come back. <laughs> uh, now, obviously, uh, you asked us a very important, very basic question, but it goes into the center of what I was asked to do earlier on, and that was to think about Europe in a global context. And I think that I was asked to do so because um, I was working with the United Nations or within the United <coughs> Nations for about 30 years. And the United Nations is a place from which you could see the world pretty well. That doesn't mean that you can do very much, but you at least see the panorama pretty well. And then, of course, the perception of problems becomes rather sharp. In addition, I have been president of Slovenia in the years 2007-2012 when I saw this transition from the optimistic period around the Lisbon Treaty towards the financial crisis and things that followed, including the beginnings of the migration crisis which started in 2011 and affected Italy at that time uh, in particular. And obviously, I have thought a lot about the changes in Europe also from within. So my view of, the, of Europe is both from outside and from inside. And in order to organize my uh, thoughts in a, in a focused way, I suggest to um, I propose to you several hypotheses for further discussion. Uh, I would be very interested in having a discussion today, and uh, yes. when I come again, I would like to continue that discussion. So I see this whole thing as a process, not as a one-time event. And since Professor Mislevets asked us to, to say what we think uh, initial, uh, at the beginning of what we think about the peculiarities of today's situation, I would like to, 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 to suggest the following. We clearly live at a time of uh, multipolarity. Multipolarity is here. Multipolarity is not something of the future. But we have to think about the nature of multipolarity today. I would call this a multipolarity plus. It is not only a multipolarity in terms of power politics or major centers of military and political powers in the world and economic power, but we must think 
about multipolarity in terms of different and sometimes competing versions of modernity, competing versions of legitimacy of states, competing versions of international order. There are different visions today, different competing concepts. And we in Europe have to be aware of that because we, are, we tend to believe that our thinking is the only thinking yes. or the main thinking. But we have to adjust to the fact that we live in a plural world, multipolar world, which is a world of several different concepts of modernity, state legitimacy, and international order. Furthermore, this world is, of course, going through a very difficult and potentially dangerous transition, and it has to be managed. Now, managing that transition requires a very careful handling. Uh, it can very easily transform itself into uh, tensions and violent conflicts, as we see around North Korea in particular today, but there are other sources of concern. So we have to be very careful in managing, in thinking about management of that transition in that multipolar context. I believe that there are two basic concepts which we have to focus on very carefully and think about them very deeply. The first one is legitimacy. What does constitute political legitimacy in the world today, in different parts of the world, and are there any shared legacies of these different concepts of legitimacy? This is one very fundamental question which has to be thought about. And of course, the academic environment like the one here in Kursek is, is very appropriate for that. And the second thing is a, a responsible governance as the core of sovereignty today. Now, my proposition is that sovereignty is not an outmoded concept. It's a very fundamental concept of organization of the world, of the international order. But it has to be understood very properly, very carefully and properly. And I think the basic, the core to understanding is responsible governance. I'll come to that in the context of Europe in a short while, uh, and I would like to organize my thoughts, as I said, in, the, in a number of hypotheses from outside and from inside. Uh, I will go very quickly through those hypotheses, and I would be very happy to discuss them further as we proceed with our discussion. Now, as I said, there is a multipolar system already in existence, and that multipolar system has to be looked at when we talk about Europe you know, from outside, basically in three substantive contexts. One is security, the other is development, and the third is values. First on security, I believe that we have already entered in a multipolar system which is dominated by three great powers, United States, China, and Russia. When we, when we talk about geopolitics, I believe we have to start with by the geopolitical situation defined by a triangular relationship between these three powers. Uh, obviously, we have to go beyond the kind of superficial impressions that dominate much of the media discussion. I do not think, for example, that what we see from the United States is improvisation. The U.S. is not improvising. The U.S. is engaged in a very deep soul-searching about its new identity and its new role in a global order in which it is not the sole remaining superpower in the unipolar world, but it has to find a leading role within a triangular relationship when it comes to military power and political power, and a leading role, perhaps more pronounced, when it comes to economic and cultural strength. The second fallacy which I think we have to reject is that China is expansionist. I do not think that the first uh, order of priority in the Chinese agenda is expansion. It is internal stability and cohesion. The main concern of China is prevention of any sort of disintegrating process, and that dominates everything else. Now, of course, China has been involved in conflicts on its borders, but it has never abandoned this primary concern, and its policy priorities are fairly clear, and they have to be recognized as such if we wish to have a productive discussion about the role of China in the future. <coughs> and the third fallacy which has to be rejected is that Russia is a regional power. I'm using this uh, inaccurate definition because it was used by the former American president in one or two occasions. 
Russia has never been a regional power. It has always been a global power. Of course, its level of power has been changing, but it is a global power. It has to be recognized as such. It, it has to be treated as such. These are the fallacies. Now, what is the way out uh, of the current situation? Where do I see the way forward, not the way out, the way forward? I would say the objective should be something that I would call a global security compact. A global security compact which would involve the three powers, the three main powers, and of course others involved in dealing with the key security questions of our era. It can start with counterterrorism, but of course it must not remain limited to that. It must include Syria, it must include Ukraine, it must include North Korea, in an order which would be dependent on the dynamic of each of these conflicts. And it cannot be done in the form of a single agreement or let alone a single treaty. It will be done in a, in a set of interlocking understandings, most of which could be developed in form of Security Council resolutions. Now, this is very briefly said how I see the security situations. Now, seen from, the, from this perspective, global perspective, EU is, uh, is not a de decisive power. It remains security dependent on the United States. It is unable to formulate a single foreign and security policy. At most, it can formulate a common security and foreign policy, and uh, it lacks the internal cohesion necessary to really make itself a major political power, not to speak about the problems that affect the military power. That, that's a separate question. But even if that was not a problem, I think the and we have to be very realistic about the reach of the inherent, uh, the internal cohesion. So my three hypotheses in the security area are this. First, multipolar world with three powers at the center. Second, global security compact as the objective. Uh, and third, recognize the inherent weakness of European Union in this context. Now I come to development. I think that when it comes to development globally and looking at Europe in this big landscape, I think that we have to recognize that we live in an era of Euro-Asian opportunity. Uh, this, of course, is historically not surprising. Asia has been, for most of history, uh, the dominant, the most, uh, the largest economic space. Uh, it has lost its role for the last two centuries, but what is two centuries? It's really very little in the long course of history. It is coming back, and this is an opportunity for Europe. I could go into figures and such things, but I believe that my, it, is, it, suffice, it, it will suffice if I say this is the time of the Euro-Asian economic opportunity. The key, and that is my fifth hypothesis, the key to using this opportunity is connectivity. Connectivity which has been placed at the center of the Chinese strategy of one belt, one road, and which has been accepted de facto by European Union. What we need to do is we need to recognize the critical importance of Euro-Asian economic and development opportunity and we have to develop the concept of connectivity to the full. Uh, and that means that one has to align and coordinate development strategies so as to use the market potential that, that, that exists, the investment opportunities that exist and to create job opportunities and then enhance all forms of communication in the Euro-Asian space. This is my fifth hy hypothesis. Obviously, my sixth hypothesis has to do with global development, and here European Union is an indispensable player. It's an indispensable player because it reaches to all parts of the world. It should not develop its Euro-Asian priority at the expense of any other priorities. And those include, of course, the transatlantic economic cooperation. And by the way, the trade with uh, Asia is already larger than the trade between Europe and the United States. We have to understand that. So the United States should be there. Africa should be there very much because it is uh, an important partner to Europe and uh, not fully understood, let alone fully developed in, in, in the sense of partnership, and we can discuss that further. And the third, so this, this, these are my uh, six hypotheses on 
security and development. Let me conclude by saying a few things about values, which one also has to explore in our discussion. We in Europe like to talk about values, and we like to talk about European values, about our common values. We like to talk about democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and other beautiful things. Where I do see the problem here? I see the problem in the fact that our talk is rather superficial. We have seen the transformative power of human rights in the past. Human rights became an extremely powerful driver of change in the period between mid-70s, essentially, after the Helsinki Accords, which have put human rights in the, in the context of European security system. And they have then helped changing Europe completely between 1975 and 1989. And that has actually triggered a very basic transformation of Europe. So human rights can be a very important power for change. But in fact, today, uh, the importance of human rights and other values is waning. We live in an era of doubt, and our talk about values is superficial. We have to change that, and we have to think about how to do that. Now, um, I would like to say, uh, uh, as my seventh hypothesis, that obviously the talk about human rights starts at home, we have to think about human rights and values much more seriously, and much more critically uh, in the context of our domestic situations. We have to think about reforms which would make the Council of Europe more relevant. The Council of Europe, we have in some in our spirit of complacency reduced to the European Court of Human Rights, and we believe that that's about it, but it is not. We have, it's, the problem is much larger, and we have to think about institutions like Council of Europe and others in this context. And obviously, at the global level, we in Europe have to think about how to uh, reshape the human rights agenda for us. Uh, we, we should uh, kind of stay away from preaching. Uh, we, we somehow preach a lot about human rights, and, and we, we shouldn't do that. We should understand that. Uh, if you need an evidence of why this is necessary, just think about Myanmar, Burma. Uh, we have been talking about Myanmar a lot, and then last March, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations adopted a resolution in which it added to the various rapporteurs that exist a fact-finding commission on human rights in Myanmar. But this was rejected by Dao Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, the, you know, de facto prime minister of Myanmar and the great human rights icon. We have to think very seriously about this. Now, <laughs> Professor Mislevets, I would like to stop here because I, I think, think uh, that well, I have exhausted my time, but I have tried to put before you several hypotheses. These are my seven hypotheses on global side. I reserve my seven hypotheses on European side for a later stage of our discussion. Thank you. Excellent, excellent introduction. Let's go further. Should the second vice chancellor Okay. Buzek, please. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation. It's quite an interesting uh, uh, thing for me. Uh, I think, in contrast uh, to President Türk, allow me to mention some things uh, which are very actual and uh, which are also sometimes disturbing us. First of all, if we are looking at the media of our time, I think every week we. <coughs> Every two or three days, we invented a new crisis. I think uh, we are very much impressed uh, having a crisis on several things. Crisis on economic crisis concerning banking, political crisis, and, and, and. Uh, I, I'm a fan of crisis, but you have to consider what means crisis. Uh, I think I learned the old Greek language, and it's crisis coming from Krino, and in translation, Krino means to judge and to decide. That's my first critique on our time. We are not using the crisis to judge and to decide. I think we are trying to impress, uh, to uh, have some feelings that might be we are close to doomsday, and so on and so on. Uh, as in Viennese, I'm quite close to this idea that we are close to doomsday because we had a very famous uh, literarian saying uh, Austria is a test station for doomsday. Uh, but if you are looking to the result, we are still existing. Uh, 
so far, I think uh, it is very nice. It might create some literature, but it has nothing to do with reality. So far, I think we have to do more reality check uh, with which problems we are confronted. And I think here, one of the things which I mentioned every day, and you had the reports uh, about what has happened uh, at, at Jean's Elysee, uh, and uh, I think every two or three days, uh, we are speaking about terrorism and so on and so on. May I say, and hopefully I'm shocking you, I'm really convinced that we are, if we are not doing something against, in the beginning of the World War III. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, World War I was declared by our beloved Emperor Franz Josef, uh, I think uh, his apostolic majesty and so on and so on. Uh, the Second World War was declared quite more simply. Mr. Hitler declared since 545 we are shooting back. It was uh, Deutsches Reich uh, against Poland. The Third World War will be not declared. It's really happening. And it has another character. Uh, the, the two world wars were very much impressed by Francis, uh, by real uh, conflicts coming here together, by horrible fighting, and so on and so on. Now it is obviously a kind of a war which is creeping in our societies and is creating insecurity. Insecurity is one of the medias uh, concerning war making because it's disturbing our societies and we have to be, say it quite clear, we have not, not yet found an answer. And the answer would for sure not be military uh, activity. I think here you can see <coughs> Mr. Trump <coughs> is quite happy to send a carrier, but obviously the carrier arrived in Singapore and is not going further on uh, because I think it's not a solution. Even concerning North Korea, which uh, uh, built up uh, military forces quite strongly and so on and so on, uh, I think it is another kind. Not on every place on the world, let's be happy, but in a certain way it's creeping in and creating the insecurity, and it is changing also our political systems. May I say, I think since 1945, my country has been uh, a real peaceful country, and we are not too much interested to build up uh, tough military forces. Now, every party in Austria is declaring we have to invest more uh, in military. Huh? I think it's a very nice idea by our defense minister saying uh, he needs more panzer. To fight terrorism with panzer, I wish him all the best. Uh, and uh, more helicopters. I think uh, if you look by helicopters to terrorists, I think you won't find them. <coughs> it is really uh, not a military question. This is a societal question. I think what is here going on, and we have not yet found uh, the uh, right answer. First block. Second block, I think <clears throat> we have to consider that Europe <coughs> by population is only 7% of the global population. And we have perspectives until uh, 2030 or whatever that we will be only 4% of the population of the world. We are still 22% of the economic power <coughs> here in the world, but it will go down. Because, and that's good, some other parts of the world are coming up and getting here more importance because it's necessary to create uh, uh, a balance. I think we have no real answer to this situation. We are mentioning the word globalization everywhere. Uh, we have a lot of people being against globalization. I'm always fed up, fed up in discussions if somebody is standing up and saying, I'm against globalization, let's decide that it is not happening which is a real nonsense. I have always a very primitive comment on this. I'm inviting uh, you, the men or women saying so, I'm inviting you to go home uh, and you are uh, putting off uh, what you have on. Look to your different clothes where they are fabricated. Uh, in China, in Malaysia, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, in Bangladesh uh, and so on and so on. That's the reality. I think the, the idea that uh, countries can be independent to others is not uh, reality. I think also big economic powers like the United States are also depending on it. Uh, Mr. Trump is trying to, to, to create answers. I think walls against Mexico or something like that. But we are depending on each other. 
I'm always fed up listening to the German TV where they are always report. I think uh, the German industry is so strong, the car industry, the strong German car industry. If you are looking where the German cars are produced, they are produced in China, in India, and, 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 and. Yeah? There is no German car. Uh, <coughs> I think it is a composition uh, here existing, and here we are depending on, on each other. Uh, I think we are not really looking to this, and if you are thinking a little bit further on it, what is suggested, we have no global regulations what is happening here. And we are moving <coughs> in the wrong direction. Uh, also Trump is here leading, but it is not only Trump. Uh, I'm not uh, a fan to blame Mr. Trump for everything. I think uh, <coughs> it's a common lack of ideas here for sure existing. Uh, because everybody is now saying, I think we have to, to reduce, we have built up customs walls and so on and so on. In this way it will not work. Uh, and I think uh, we have no development in the direction of a global order on this. Because we don't have uh, some kind of global state. We are even not able to, to create the European state. You can see the difficulties which are existing. And I think we are still depending on a certain vision of a nation state, which is also not working. Uh, as I went to the university, mm -hmm. <coughs> we learned national economy. I think that's a wrong impression. There is no national economy anymore, uh, because I think it is a global economy existing. Uh, and so far, I think <coughs> we have to change the title, which is not solving the problem. But we have to change the thinking uh, what is existing here uh, and what we are doing uh, here. I think we have to discuss in a certain way uh, a kind of a global order, which is existing in small pieces, uh, but not really uh, working. I think also being at an uh, institution like a university, I have to say it, I think we have a very strong development on technology and connections and so on and so on. But also we, we are missing here the rules. I think I'm always deeply, deeply impressed uh, if again Mr. Trump is able with some remarks, uh, 140 words every day, uh, to give an impression. Eh? I think he's twittering uh, and so far everybody is really shocked. I think you have to look back, it's nothing to do with Trump, but we have no rules of this kind of information. It is an important part of <coughs> our information society, but I think we are not able, I think, to have rules, what is possible, what should not be possible, and, and so on and so on. I think uh, that's one of the parts where I would say that the universities, or science especially, I think have to do something uh, uh, in this direction. And to make a general remark, we are living in the time <coughs> of the unforeseeable. Uh, I think uh, we are missing capacity to look forward. Uh, we have a lot of think tanks. I think everybody is now a think tank. I'm always saying what we need is more do tanks, uh, <laughs> which are not really existing. I think a lot of people are living out of this. I wish them all the best. But what about the consequences out of this? That's not really existing. I give you a simple uh, example. All the question of the refugees, of migration, and so on, so on, was foreseeable. I think we have a lot of papers existing where it was predicted. And then we are really, including my country, wondering that they are really coming. Oh, they are only coming to Italy. Eh? They shall stay there. Eh? Uh, that they are also moving from Italy to Austria, Germany, and so on, and so on, uh, is quite clear. And we have no instruments uh, in this uh, uh, direction. I think what we're really missing, and there are some consequences on education, uh, what is the consequence of the necessary strategy to have empathy for each other? I think empathy would be very important because it's creating the desire to know what are the others feeling, what is their judgment on this. I think uh, we are always very clever, and here I'm criticizing my small country also. Uh, we have now a government which is declaring every second day what the others have to do. Uh, I think we know everything what the others have to do, uh, including the fact that nobody of this government is going to the others and explaining them what they have to do, because they would explain us what we have to do. 
uh, and uh, that's not very well received. I think in this, and Pega Badlu doing it in the presence of a former Deputy Secretary General, I think we have to look a little bit to the institution which are existing quite rich. I think all the difficulties concerning Ukraine and others uh, uh, happened without any consequences for the United Nations, for the Council of Europe, and so on and so on. I think after weeks and months, they are doing discussions, making a resolution which is not accepted. And I think the only one uh, organization which was a little bit working concerning the Ukrainian crisis was OEC. Uh, I think they managed it to have even some observers that we are getting here more information and some limits uh, with the difficulty that the Minsk decisions uh, are not really realized and so. I think we need a discussion. I am a fan of United Nations, OECE, Council of Europe and so on and so on. But I think we have to discuss how can we make it workable, that there are really consequences out of this. We are investing a lot of money for this, uh, but for the consequences there is really not enough done. That's not, I think, to criticize. It's always usual to criticize international organizations, especially the European Union is here an object for criticism. Uh, but I think uh, <coughs> if you would consider, and that would be an interesting subject of research, uh, if we would not have had European institutions, if we would uh, not have had United Nations, what would have happened? <coughs> I think we would have even more difficulties and so on and so on. I think this is a consequence of this idea of a new nationalism. I think in all my love to my English friends uh, and the consequences of Brexit, uh, I will look at what they are doing. Uh, this is a general uh, development. America first, Great Britain first, Germany first and so on and so on. Huh? I think what means first? They are going out of the rest of the world. That's not really possible. We are depending on each other. And I think here we have to do more in this direction to explain it quite practically, that it is understood by the human beings that they are depending on each other. Sometimes it's coming out. Uh, concerning ecology, I think we are getting a little bit by warming up of the earth and so on and so on. Uh, there are fears uh, <coughs> that the North Pole is melting down and uh, the water is coming up and maybe some islands will vanish and so on and so on. But it is some islands. Uh, I think uh, that's their problem, not ours. Uh, I think it is our problem. Uh, and I think on this we have to consider that we are in a certain way depending on, uh, on each other. Rightly, it was mentioned in the introduction, uh, the multipolar situation uh, we have. But what are the rules of this multipolar situation? Is it a competition only, or is cooperation possible? And in which way can cooperation here really work? I think here we need a lot more fantasy uh, to, to live on this. And I think it will be quite more. Uh, one of the shocking arguments, and I've already mentioned it, uh, is migration. I think uh, sometimes we are moving forward and uh, saying, ah, by migration also the old Roman Empire fell down. Huh? Okay, <coughs> it's a nice perspective. Huh? <laughs> it might happen also to Europe and so on and so on. Or are we doing something? I think I'm uh, looking to my beloved colleagues in, in, in politics. Uh, I think our foreign minister has now uh, the very good idea that we shall stop the saving of people in the Mediterranean Sea. Huh? Maybe even it was a certain formulation where he said, I think if they are dying, that might be a good signal to the other that they are using this way. Huh? It is a little bit cynical, uh, I think. Uh, there should be more people drowning uh, when in consequence, I think they will learn that it is not a possible way. Uh, I think we have a basic discussion here on this subject. I think it would be more important to discuss how can we hinder people uh, that they have to leave uh, their country, their region, because uh, there is no harvest, uh, nothing to eat, no water, and so on and so on. Here we need a lot of fantasy, and uh, I think things are for sure more possible uh, as they are really done. Uh, I think uh, there's a discussion where also scientific institutions uh, should do a lot uh, that we are coming on. Uh, 
rightly, the President Türk mentioned three powers. But what is the matter with the other part? The India is coming up, 1.3 billion people. Uh, what is the matter with Africa? I think the number of uh, human beings living there is increasing every year in horrible figures. I think if I remember what I have learned in school, how many millions living there, and now we are arriving at the billions, and so on and so on, and it will have for sure some consequences. And I think here we have not uh, a strategy. You know? We are saying, okay, Libya might be a way where they are going out, but whatever are we doing? I think some ideas are closing. For the moment, we are closing everything. Uh, let's close. Let's build up walls. I think we are not really learning out of history. The biggest wall ever built up was the Chinese wall. Uh, it has not hindered the invasion of China. I think the Mongols were coming up and were reigning uh, China for 400 years. Huh? Uh, so far, I think we need this discussion in this direction. These are the real political problems uh, which for sure uh, are here existing. Rightly mentioned Eurasia, uh, because I think uh, Europe is a kind of appendix to the Asian continent, not more. Huh? But do we have rules on this subject? We have an interesting di discussion about the Silk Road. It was partly started by China, partly started by Turkey. I'm joining always uh, this meeting. I think mainly we are discussing transport possibilities about the Siberian Railway, or can we build up highways, uh, and so on and so on. But I think that's for sure not enough. Because one of the great concerns, and I have to, to do a little bit uh, with, with what is discussed internally in Russia, is the fact that on the one side <coughs> of the border between China and Russia in, in East Siberia, on the one side they are living 300 uh, million Chinese, and on the other side they are living 300,000 uh, Russians. That's one of the main concerns. I'm always admiring uh, the political discussions. Now the Russians will work with the Chinese. I think the Chinese will not work with the Russians. I think that's one of the conflict situations which are for sure existing. Uh, I think in a certain way dangerous because the Chinese, as a businessman, are coming up uh, in the eastern Siberia. There's a lot of concern on this subject not really discussed. And I think it has something to do with the rest of Europe, uh, which we are. I'm changing the subject, uh, touching also the question of values. There is a desire of values. That the re region, <coughs> that's a reason, and uh, I'm impressed by this, that religions are coming up. Uh, now we have again the discussion about the desire for religions. Uh, not in the traditional way, by churches and so on and so on, but something is going in this direction. Uh, uh, parties are sometimes behaving that they can offer a kind of a religion. It plays a very important role. If you're looking to the uh, US elections, uh, here are some movements going in this direction. And it might be a reason why the Russians recently have forbidden uh, the Jehovah uh, Church. Uh, uh, I don't witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. Je Jehovah's Witnesses. Huh? Uh, I think, uh, is it a danger for Russia? I don't think so. But I think there is a certain concern uh, what might happen here. Uh, so far the question of religion is of great importance because it is also a danger if it is misused. Uh, I think uh, we have to, we secularized part of uh, of Europe, we have not the right way to touch it. And the consequences, because communism was also a kind of a religion, I think it vanished, but there's a lack of, of uh, values uh, existing here. That's one of the reasons why things are happening, like it is in Poland and so on and so on. And maybe in Hungary, partly, it plays also an important role if you're looking to the fact uh, that Viktor Orban is uh, very much based in one of the churches here uh, in Hungary which is not discussed in the other parts of Europe. I think there should be some awareness and it means something. <coughs> I think we have still a, an outdated look to this situation. I'm always in love with uh, two expressions. 
ex-oriente lux, light <laughs> from the east, and ex-occidente luxus. <laughs> but this is questions now, because the reason why we have a lot of uh, immigration is ex-occidente luxus. Because they can see by TV how we are living and they want to, to, to have the same uh, here. Uh, and we have not the right answers how to share it, uh, what to do on this subject, and so on and so on. I think here we have a lot to do. And uh, there's this famous old Chinese word, may you live in interesting times, very which is not a very friendly wish. No. But we are living in very interesting times, for sure. Uh, here being on a place which was also for some times a borderline uh, with a lot of conflicts here. Because that's the reason why this castle is uh, standing here. And you can see a castle line here for sure existing. I think that should be a push forward to consider it. Thank you very much. You, you save a lot of time for me. I put down all these questions, but I don't have to ask because you are answering already. So now, Professor Evin, it's your turn. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back in uh, Kursak, uh where I have, as you said, um, have been coming um, for nearly two decades. Um, and I've seen uh, the uh, initial Europa House now uh, becoming a partly a campus and a center of uh, advanced studies. Uh, it's all uh, wonderful and, and it is becoming a uh, meeting ground uh, and uh, of intellectual exchange. It, it's uh, wonderful to see that. Um, the, uh, the I'm confronted with a situation here where um, I'm the third speaker of a relatively uh, long session where uh, President Türk uh, has given us uh, very sophisticated hypotheses that we can uh, debate over the next few sessions here. And uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Busek then uh, gave us a very incisive critique of um, uh, not only the geopolitical situation, uh, but also the inadequate responses or, and perceptions of uh, what is really uh, going on. Um, that, again, uh, put me, I think, puts me in a uh, disadvantageous situation that it is very difficult to add uh, anything of excitement uh, to uh, these um, very important statements that we should come back to. So I thought I might uh, briefly make three points, uh, not with respect to the situation, but how we perceive the situation. Um, uh, my first point is really um, that the a simple one, that the geopolitical situation in the world is changing. Uh, for certainly for our generation, that the the world, the balances, the uh, the uh, confrontation and uh, cooperation between East and West and North and South that we have been um, uh, we have grown up with and uh, we have matured and, and uh, became uh, retired and became uh, emeritus. Uh, these are something of the past. The essential uh, change is uh, one of uh, a shift in the center of gravity from the Euro-Atlantic to China. China looms very large. Um, and that has uh, put a, uh, a, uh, into motion uh, what we can expect uh, changes in the general weight and importance uh, as reflected in the global economy, as mentioned, not only China, but India is coming next, and uh, Africa will also be uh, an important actor, not only because of population, but uh, uh, increasing numbers of increasing uh, oil and gas reserves that are being uh, found in Africa, which will substantially change uh, Africa's ability 
uh, to uh, play an international role, along with the fact that it will certainly make a, a very important uh, uh, effect on the standard of life in Africa. But there are also countervailing factors as far as Africa is concerned that uh, there is, because of climate change, there is greater uh, drought uh, that is coming up there, which has implications globally and certainly will have implications with regard to uh, migration from Africa up north. But the uh, center of gravity, it is right now, we are really looking at China more than uh, uh, the other uh, anticipated changes. And China brings to mind uh, basically that is China going to uh, be the power that ends the um, European and then later um, uh, Euro-American uh, leadership of uh, the liberal order. And what we mean by liberal order is, is not necessarily a liberal order um, that uh, has affected or shaped similarity of politics in the West, but what we really mean by liberal order is a, a common uh, set of procedures to sustain global trade. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we have the Dumbarton Oaks institutions and other institutions and so on. And this was a long time in the building since uh, Britain uh, expanded uh, into international uh, and global trade uh, with its colonies and its colonies feeding the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the United States followed, uh, took the relay flag later on uh, after the Second uh, World War. Uh, the approach to this is, is changing. There is both an internal change, like uh, the borders seem to be going up, or at least there are people, as was mentioned, uh, that <coughs> a, a, a craving for protecting the nation state and your national trade and so on and so forth. That is what's happening internally uh, to a disturbing degree within the Euro-Atlantic orbit. But also at the same time within the Euro-Atlantic orbit that there is a concern that uh, an external power like China might be the uh, threat to this liberal order. Um, this is a situation in which I think it is a matter of discomfort to the degree that if there isn't the kind of order that can be sustained in future that we're used to, then are we going to have a lack of order? Uh, are we going to be confronted with that? Or are we going to be confronted with possibly something worse, uh, that is, an imposed China-centered order, whatever that might be. Uh, we do not know what it might be, but we have apprehensions that it will be imposed to the West. So we have a set of apprehensions that come from the very fact that uh, the center of gravity, economic, population, and otherwise, is shifting. This is a process, as you said, and uh, the process is ongoing, um, and our approaches to this process uh, differ. My second point is that the, one of the difficulties, I believe, in a correct assessment of uh, this, uh, uh, what is really happening, uh, changes in, in, in geopolitics, is uh, that we have, since the Second World War, uh, have developed a particular optic uh, looking at, uh, geopolitically, uh, 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 looking at the non-Western world. There is one optic has been the Euro-Atlantic um, 
uh, alliance optic, and it looks from the NATO perspective, uh, from uh, the Atlantic uh, through Western Europe to the Iron Curtain. An Iron Curtain fell, it started looking further, but it ends at the border with Russia. And Russia basically it was the essential power that said that in fact negated the um, essential principle on which the European soft power was based. European soft power is that you um, export your institutions uh, in concentric circles to your next neighbor and then further. And when Russia was reached after the big bank enlargement to the east, Russia simply said, well, we are not European, we are Eurasian. And that was finished. So it reached a certain end. Now the other optic was the Pacific optic, which after the Second World War was essentially a, um, <laughs> you, you, you heard, uh, the expert on that, <laughs> but um, uh, if I may, I would say that it is essentially, and uh, Pacific was an American uh, theater, and uh, relations with China, geopolitical relations with China, uh, uh, were a matter of uh, American uh, fleet and American defense strategy uh, there. Now, if that optic was inadequate, it was nevertheless the one that uh, the Western world continued. Our think tanks, excuse me, but uh, our think tanks uh, worked uh, on that basis. Uh, transatlantic operations worked in that on that basis, and, and so on. Now, that optic is, has made us in the Western world miss a very important aspect uh, of the non-Western, the fact and reality of Eurasia. Because you either looked at Eurasia and ended the perspective with uh, European Russia, or you looked across the Pacific and ended with China. We have not developed an adequate, incisive idea of what kind of internal dynamics and what kind of security threats that Eurasia has in terms of, um, as the Busek mentioned, for example, uh, the relation with China and Russia, and uh, China has both very large population and it has the economic means to go and extract, invest and extract uh, oil and gas in Russia in order to meet its increasing demand. Russia's concern with that is that China not only comes with uh, engineering and capital uh, to do that, but that it is a door to bring a substantial population of the Chinese to unpopulated southern Siberia. I mean, Russia is there. But we have not also touched the fact that there is a common security concern that Russia and China have, which is also our common security concern of jihadist Islam making inroads to Central Asia. And this is Achilles' heel of both uh, China, uh, which can deal with it uh, more easily than Russia, where bombs are exploding the way that they explode in, in Western countries. Uh, so I have uh, been uh, proposing to uh, think tanks, uh, various think tanks, that we should look at uh, an amended perspective uh, and, and really start examining Eurasia 
as a coherent entity in itself and not imagine <coughs> Russia on the one side, China on the other. Um, third, uh, and last, uh, is um, the political winds that we are um, seeing, uh, witnessing, that have certain similarity in many parts of the world. We are disturbed, but I don't think uh, we are quite um, able either for reasons of political correctness or reasons of uh, inability to see clearly either or a combination that um, there is a commonality that is these <coughs> political winds that are um, uh, that are uh, sweeping certain things in a variety of countries. One is common uh, aspect of those is anti-establishment. Uh, this became very evident with the uh, uh, election of first uh, to, as candidate of the Republican Party and then um, the election of Trump as president of the United States, but before that, uh, uh, Trump <coughs> becoming uh, the Republican candidate thought was a wake-up call for the Republican establishment. All, all of Republican establishment uh, basically tried to prevent that, and they could not. Um, there are similarities. I think Brexit vote was a similar uh, anti-establishment trying and successfully uh, actually achieving a no vote at the expense, at, at the expense of uh, Britain's uh, economic uh, health. Uh, there are others, um, populists in both uh, East and West, but unfortunately more so, uh, more in proportion uh, among um, Western uh, political leaders. Now, we look at this and we're quite disturbed uh, because it is, uh, it is uh, something that actually uh, attacks some of the values uh, that uh, we, are, uh, we have been defending, upholding, and essentially uh, those values have uh, molded certainly our generation in this geography and uh, most of the United States, uh, if not all. Uh, but there is some other danger I uh, see in terms of the geopolitical implications of this wide uh, ranging populism and I believe that is that there, there is a common aspect of uh, populist politics uh, and that is attacking and in fact uh, vengefully trying to, um, trying to destroy institutions. That is the most, it is not so much who wins and uh, it is unfortunate to see uh, an, an impoliteness taking uh, over the political sphere and so on. But I believe the greater danger is that there is a common uh, enmity in this populism towards institutions. And uh, this is very evident, for example, that the, uh, Trump came up with uh, certain um, uh, ideas and, and uh, basically he sold the idea that certain institutions were not in the interest or they were not American in his terms, uh, but the institutions have reacted so he has to, had to mellow. That is not true in every single country that we know, um, but the uh, danger of that, and I think we have to be aware of uh, the, the ultimate danger of that, is that if institutions are weakened, uh, well, we might be faced in the Western world 
with the Humpty Dumpty syndrome that you can't put it back together again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a short coffee break. That was a wonderful Schlusswort. We are going to continue with Central Europe and the possibilities of education and cooperation. Thank you. It was an excellent start.